Welcome, welcome, welcome. Welcome to Champions Yourself. Who are you? I'm Chris Ferguson, your host. It has always been a dream of mine to showcase ordinary people doing extraordinary things in life for themselves and for others. Those who have taken their dreams, their ideas, and turned it into their reality. As they reach beyond their personal struggles, their pains, and their traumas, where so many people have given up, these people don't do that. They walk through their obstacles and challenges. They don't know where they're going. They don't know how to get there. They're just trusting themselves enough not to give up, to do the follow through in their personal life, their career, and in relationships. And this is what I call a champion. Today, I have an amazing lady, Malisa, Maya Lisa, uh, Malisa, getting, going, going South Florida on you, girlfriend. Um, Adams is here today, and she's an amazing individual, and she's all about TEDx. And she doesn't know this yet, but she's going to find out that I'm in, I'm actually working towards doing a TEDx speaking. So this is going to be an exciting, exciting interview today. Let's welcome Maya Lisa. Hello. Hello. <laughs> you didn't know that, did you? That I am working you did towards not that. <laughs> That's yeah. fabulous. Yeah. It's, it's, uh, I've always wanted to be a, um, a writer, which I am part of the Blue Talk series. I don't know if you've heard that. I have not. And it, it, um, the books, they're compilation books, but they're international bestsellers. Mm -hmm. And I'm in three of the three of the six of the volume. And so oh. I've got a new one coming out here later this month. So I'm so excited. And then I'm working on my own book, which is called You've Championed Yourself. Who are you? And it's the background oh. of how it all came to be and how I, in my life, the things that I endured to get to this point. And then once I retired last year in May, in fact, it, it, May 28th was, I retired last year. Congratulations. Thank you. Thank you. And, and July 7th was my first podcast. I had finally, I was like, I've got my voice. I can speak. I don't have to sit. I don't have to sit in the background and say nothing. <laughs> And letting no grass grow under your feet. That's awesome. Absolutely. Absolutely. So it's been amazing. But I'm kind of curious, and I think my audience is curious also, about your background. What, what got you from there to here? What was that process? Yeah. What was that journey? Well, I was a working professional early in my, in my life, and I was in Silicon Valley. I did lots of presentations. I worked for a software company. I also had taught university before I was um, lured away, but then I got the chance to be a stay-at-home mom. And near the time, let's see, when my son was about sixth grade, it became necessary that I go back to work. And I went back to teaching at the university part-time. And I was asked to, I was, IT is my background, but being out of that for 20 years is not something you can just pick up and do again, right? <laughs> <laughs> and so instead of the flow of information through technology, I started working on the flow of information from, you know, from our heart and our mind and onto the paper, into the spoken word for people and started teaching public speaking at the local university. Not long after that, I was asked to teach another class called Professional Presentations. And in that one of the assignments is to do a TED style talk. Now it's not a TED talk because TED is very strict about their branding. So it's how do you how do you speak like TED? How do you do a TED style talk? And at the same mm -hmm. time, both the local community and the neighboring community held their first TEDx events and I attended. And they said, wait, do you teach public speaking? Would you coach our speakers? Because some of them could have used help last time. <laughs> and I said, I'd be happy to. So I've been doing that for a while. And then little by little, other people sought me out and said, could you help me find a stage? Or could you help me with my TEDx talk that I've already landed a stage for? Or how could I do more with my TEDx talk now that I've given one? Or can I tell you what's, what's happened since I've given a TEDx talk? I got one of those calls yesterday. It was so, so fun. And so it all happened just very organically. And it's something that I just eat, drink, sleep, breathe, <laughs> and do all the time. I had nine speakers on a stage in March uh, across the United States. So it's, it's fun. Uh, that's, that's awesome because most people don't realize the process yes. of getting and becoming a TEDx speaker. Mm -hmm. And in becoming that TEDx speaker, um, <clears throat> there it's not as easy as you think. It's one thing to be able to sit and talk with somebody. I tell everybody, let's do a podcast. Come on my podcast. Let's have a cup of coffee and just talk. 
that is totally different than getting up on a stage in front of all these people that you don't know and present something that you don't know how they're going to perceive it. Yeah. And one of the things about communication is not communicating. It's how they perceive what you're speaking. Yes. And most people equate a TED stage or initially to like, it's, it's a chance for me to get on a circuit and tell and go give my keynote speech on stage and stage and stage. That is not TEDx. First, there's a difference between the TED stage and TEDx. And, and you can give more than one TEDx, or you can give a TEDx and a TED, <clears throat> excuse me, like Brene Brown and Simon Sinek. But most people don't even get a chance to do a TEDx talk. It's the most credible stage in the world. And a TEDx talk is a license given regionally or locally by the TED stage. You have to apply. You get the license for a year. It takes about six months to put an event together, including finding your speakers and having them work on their message that's not a keynote. And if you were lucky enough to land two TEDx stages at the same time, they have to be different ideas. Mm. It's all about the idea. It's not about, are you a fabulous speaker? It's <laughs> about what's that idea that you have and can you share it in under 18 minutes? In fact, here's my first tip is having done this now over the last seven years, I haven't seen a stage in years that gives you more than 12, sometimes 13 minutes. Sometimes less. Some I've seen some TEDx talks that I've watched. You know, just to just to get a feel of the whole thing, it's five minutes long. It's like, what the world? How do you get a message out in five minutes? Oh, but that is a crack. It, it, it is. And my job as a coach is not to help you put things in as much as it is to take things out, so we can find that one idea and have it stand out and be supported through story, through statistics. Uh, but it's not about your story. It's about the idea wrapped in your story. It's not about the data you did. It's the the idea that comes from what you learned about the research that you did with it. It's that, so therefore, my greater conclusion is this. This is what I have to add to conversation. And that goes back to where TED started from. TED stands for, and if anybody's watching and knows, put in the chat, what does TED stand for? Those three letters. Do you know, Chris? Technology, education, and I believe it's development. Um, technology, entertainment, oh. and design. Think California. That's where it started. <laughs> That's what Californians are known for, right? But technology. wasn't it techies that started it as a, as a way of, of get their message out without yes. getting their message out? And they also said this, they're not going to be keynotes. They are going to be the experts in technology, entertainment, and design. And they're going to come each year to a conference, an annual conference, which is still held today in April. It's coming up, except during, the, during COVID, it didn't happen but it's held in person, still continues to this day. And it's much more than, than those things now. It can be on most anything, which we'll talk about, but it's what do you have to add to the conversation? What can you, what's an idea that your audience, your fellow experts can implement to make life easier for them? It's all about the idea. I love that. I love that. And and like I said, I thought it was, it was tech, I knew it was technology. I thought it was education instead of entertainment. Mm -hmm. And yep. then instead of designer development, and it was the process of what they were developing when they started it. And so I yes. love, I love that. And, and for some reason I'm drawn to it. Yes, it is because it's conversational. It's not a performance. It's mm -hmm. not here. Are my three main points. It's here's my one idea. Mm -hmm. And it can be, and if you think that it can't be a child who has an idea or it can't be a child in a third world country who has an idea, think again, mm -hmm. because Chris Anderson, the head of TED for the last 19 years, was ran into this African boy. And in the conversation, he found out that he was in charge of keeping his dad's cattle, his herd of cattle safe mm -hmm. in the lions. And so he had brainstormed as a 12 year old or whatever, what he could do like a scarecrow. And of course that didn't last long and, and fires. And of course that didn't last long. And finally it was like blinking clear Christmas lights wrapped around and then that idea spread because the other boys said, can, can you help us do this so that we can protect our own dads? So yeah. it's not just here in the United States and it's not just someone who's an expert expert. It's just an idea that helps other mm -hmm. people. Mm -hmm. There are many different types of Ted talks too. It can be a performance. I just had also a jump rope team. They have in 2019 when they could travel last time they were in Norway and they took five of the championships. 
and they performed on stage. So a TEDx talk can be a performance. It can be a big idea. It can be a little idea. It can be an issue, but you have to turn that issue into what the idea is that you can do. An example that TED gives when they're looking for global speakers is, here's the topic, there's an opioid crisis. What your idea is from either being in the medical field or, or someone who struggled with it or family struggled through it or whatever aspect you're coming with your expertise, what's that one thing that you can add to the conversation mm -hmm. to us in that crisis? Mm -hmm. See, as a, most people don't realize, I've had three near-death experiences in my wow. life. And one was at four and I got underneath a cabinet sink and drank some liquids, Ooh. liquid yes. Drano. They mm -hmm. don't know why it didn't hurt me or whatever, but I, my body flatlined because it was so toxic and I was so small. And then the second one was at 16. And then the third one was in 2012. I had two pulmonary embolisms, one in each lung. Mm -hmm. And so I'm this anomaly that's like, you know, okay, what's next? What she's going to be through, you know, what can she talk about? But it was because of many other unfortunately net bad things that happened in my life that made me go into law enforcement. It was actually my brother's death by a drunk driver. Wow. And so I wanted to avenge his death. I, I mean, I was 20 years old. I'm a street kid. I'm on, I grew up in an orphanage. Most people oh. don't. Yeah. Most people don't know that. And the thing was, is it was because of society norms. Yeah. So my talk I want to talk about is how society norms actually hurt society. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Because the fact was, is that when my, my dad and mom were married, they were both in the army. My dad's Native American. My mother's white. And when she got pregnant, the army says, well, you can't stay in that. We, we weren't prepared for women to get pregnant in the army. So you can be in a, in a, a military wife, but you can't be in the military at this point. <laughs> so she they gave her a dishonorable discharge. Yeah. And she Did you say now, dishonorable, dishonorable. Oh, no, discharge? They gave her an honorable. Oh, discharge. I'm like, oh, no, 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 that, no, no, I wasn't dishonorable. But anyway, but my dad was an alcoholic and she was physically violent. They had six kids and he decided to up and leave. And get transferred and not tell anybody. He just didn't come home. And so the church told my mother, the Catholic church told my mother at that time, because society norms back in the 60s, mm -hmm. divorce wasn't common. It was frowned upon. Mm -hmm. And most people don't realize that how strong the society norms were back in that day. Oh, yeah. So the church said, we'll help you. And I turned eight in February that year. I had my first Holy Communion on, on Mother's Day, May 10th that year. And June 6, I found myself orphaned and separated from my other brothers and my sister. And that's where I grew up. So I hated the church. I hated society norms. I hated life. I hated everything about being. And so you don't know, you know, when people say, well, society says this is the way it has to be. I have never been, nor will I ever be a person that follows society norms. And it has served me well. Wow. That's so powerful. So when you when you do, when you don't realize you're saying, well, society says this or this is the, the, the buzzword of the day doesn't mean it's the truth. It doesn't mean that everybody feels the same way. And what but, I love about what you say is what makes a, an idea a TED idea is when you not only add to our understanding, take us someplace maybe we would never experience before, but you challenge our assumption. So you're challenging our assumption that the way society functions is best for everybody. Mm -hmm. And it's just, I mean, the thing is, is for, for people that have been sexually assaulted or sexually molested as a child, yeah. you know, this me too, wasn't a me too. Mm -hmm. It was a society norm. Oh, me too, everybody, everybody. But it, it was isolated. It was categorized. It wasn't open for everybody. Women honoring women, if you want to hold a woman's rally, then invite every woman, no matter their opinion. Don't have the ignorance and the hate that that society has. Allow every woman in there, no matter her opinion, and unify as women, not political, but as women. And, and that love in itself could conquer the hate. You may not know this, but they found when they started TED that only 20 percent of the speakers were female. So they started. So TED happens in April each year. TED Women happens in the end of Dece end of November, 1st of December. I did not know that. Yeah. And then local stages can also apply to say, we want to have a TEDx Women license, but they can only be held at the same time 
as TED Women at the end of November through through December. And so that there you mainly have a, a, a female audience with mainly female speakers, not 100 percent. But that's something that a lot of people don't know about. I, I didn't know that know about it. And I'm studying to try to learn how to become a TEDx speaker. Yeah. But the fact is, is that when you support, see, I've, because of my circumstances, I became a shamanic practitioner mm. at 16. And it's all about getting in harmonized with your divine masculine and your divine feminine. All my life, I worked in my divine masculine, being in law enforcement in yeah. the time that I was in it, it was a male's dominant world. And when I went to, I, I was working there and, and went through several different things and went out to the penitentiary, which was a men's penitentiary. I was one of three women working there at the time. And so the fact is, is it was a dominant male situation. But when you can handle yourself and hold your own space, you earn that respect. And that's always where I came from. Yeah. I mean, even people would want to know what was it like to be in, in that? It's well, it was it, it was crazy because it was dominantly male. But the thing is, is I did have a man come up to me, 70 years old or something. And he says, oh, you know, I was brand new in the in the facility. I, you know, I was a little naive. I'd never been arrested, you know, thank yeah. God. I mean, I mean, I did some stuff as a street. I was a street kid. What do you expect? I just yeah. never got caught. OK, <laughs> so um in that, he says to me, he says, you know, I shouldn't be in here. And I said, oh, really? Why is that? He says, I would have had an epileptic seizure and I don't remember molesting those four four-year-olds. <laughs> Every cell in my body was like somebody had just doused it with gasoline and lit it on fire. I had such an angry understanding of it. And I said, listen, let me explain some things to you. One, I'm not stupid. Two, the last thing that's going to get erect in an epileptic seizure, look this up, because if you don't know anatomy, you need to find out about it, is going to be your penis. You better get the blah, 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 blah away from me before I come out of this control housing yeah. and show you what a woman can do to a child molester. Yes. yes. Wow. I, I mean, it lit my world up. I, I wanted to go through the glass, the bulletproof glass. I wanted to go through it and just tear him up. Yeah. To think that you can, the excuses you tell yourself to make this okay. I was just, oh. That's crazy. If I, if I can share one of those nine speakers in March was brave enough to tell his story about being molested mm. as a freshman in high school by the seniors on the baseball team that were afraid he was going to take their position. Oh, I, it's interesting you say that because I went to work at an alternative high school in South Florida. And one of their initiations to the baseball team, and this was the, the school's baseball team, mm -hmm. was that when you go off to a game, the new kid, the new guys get an, an almond joy inserted in the rectum in front of the whole team, whether you want to or not. Oh, my goodness. And so, I mean, it's... The, the coincidence of this happening compared yes. to what I had to do the investigation. That's why I knew it was, I'm like, it's well, you know, he, we know. He, he said, I was not going to tell anybody, but there was one other boy who was, and he told his parents and they came to tell my parents, thankfully, but it, the blame all, you know, came, came on, on uh, me. But he, he said, as he told the story, how then a female detective came to gather evidence He's like, I was so horrified, but in his talk, he thanked her mm -hmm. for the difference she made in his life and how respectfully she handled all the evidence. That was powerful. He ended up getting a standing ovation just by sharing that and the way he crafted it. We worked hard because I said, you're going to get triggered. You're going to have to see your therapist. Yes. You're going to have to think of legal things and so forth. But if it's okay with you, I have something that he gave me. Sure. Um, show it to me. I'd love to. So, you know, this is going to be video. This is videotaped. And it. I have a YouTube channel with You've Championed Yourself. Who are you? So it will be on there. So please okay, feel free. Great. So anyway, at the end, he, well, first I noticed when he was on stage that he had these brand new athletic shoes on. They're Air Jordans. Mm -hmm. And afterwards, he had them off and he was having the other people that had shared the stage with him sign them. And he'd say, sign both of these, sign both of these, sign both of these. And then he took one and gave it to me as Aww. a thank you. Ah, that's amazing. I love it. Other. Like he bought them three weeks before. They're a special edition Air Jordans. I was so mm. 
touched that he felt that <laughs> I had helped him so much with his this painful journey that he'd been on that affects him today. He's still gone on to do wonderful things in his life, but he just says people need to know men are assaulted too. Date rape is awful. But well, twenty percent of men get assaulted. Well, the thing was is most people don't know that a lot of the the Catholic Church had a lot of sexual assault, both against boys and girls. Mm -hmm. And these residential schools that they had for the for the Native Americans, yeah. there was a lot of them that were sexually assaulted and murdered. And that's yes. And so the missing um reservations right now be in Canada alone, just so far in Canada, they've recovered 9,000 children's corpse that the, that these residential homes had said, oh, well, they ran away. They ran home. We don't know what happened to them. And then they were able to identify them through DNA. And so the atrocities that happen in the world, and most people don't realize when you get out West, in Montana, Idaho, North Dakota, mm -hmm. South Dakota, mm -hmm. um, Nebraska, Northern Colorado. It isn't much different than it was back in the day. There's some third world countries there and they're called Native American reservations. And there's been a lot of people that just go and disappear. A lot of discrimination, a lot of... Um, I live about four, mm, an hour and 15 minutes from a reservation here in mm -hmm. Idaho. So it's, and, and the th fact is, is, I mean, when I was growing up and people found out my dad was Native American, I was that squaw. And yeah. that's, you might as well call me an MF because that's how I'm going to take it. So the fact is, is so, so I've been there. I've walked that mile. I've done those, those things. But it, what, you were talking about TED and TEDx being a difference. What's the difference between them? TED is, TED is the annual conference held and then if people started saying, well, we'd like to have a TED event in our, at our university, in our town. And so they started giving licenses to a region and saying, okay, so some of them that have been around for a long time are like TEDx Sydney, Australia, for example, or TEDx Amsterdam or TEDx London. They've been around for 10, 12 years, TEDx Marin. And there, when I started doing this, um, seven years ago, they gave 300 licenses around the world. Mm. Now there are 3,300 licenses given around the world. Wow. So there are many stages, but that being said, well, and to do that, they're all volunteers, they're nonprofits. And so you don't get paid to organize a TEDx event and you don't get paid to speak at a TEDx event either. It's your coming because you fit in with the vibe of that community or university, the theme that they're having or the topics that they're talking about and the variety that they want to bring. And, and you're making them look good at the event because you're an expert in something that they're interested in that affects their community. Mm, okay. You have to get a regional mindset. You have to get, you have to know that community. An example is TEDx St. Louis just had their speaker applications open and they closed April 1st. And they said, if you don't have an intrinsic tie to St. Louis and somehow don't apply. And, but I see, I love that because the thing is, is they're showcasing St. Louis. So why wouldn't they want the people that's going to speak of it in all lights in all understandings, yeah. but know the area. Yeah. And so I, I get that. In, in fact, one of the things I guess for me, you know, I was told, well, you don't have to do a TEDx in your town or even in your state, wherever you can get on stage, do that. And I'm like, I don't feel comfortable doing that. And now I know why, yeah. because I want to be able to resonate. Yes. Right. And so that so, doesn't mean like maybe you happen to go to school in St. Louis and haven't lived there in 20 years. You still have an intrinsic tie and you understand right. it. So it's, and, and not every stage is like that. You can get on other stages that you have no tie to, but, they may want you because of your topic, mm -hmm. because of your idea. So there are really three ways to get on a TEDx stage. One is they reach out to you because you're the expert. In fact, some stages don't take applications. TEDx uh, in um, Provo, Utah, TEDx BYU, they reach out to the experts. And that's pretty much the same thing on a big on, on the TED stage, too. You can apply. You can go. Anybody can go to TED.com right now and apply to be on a TED stage, but it's pretty unheard of. 
unless there's something just like, wow, in your application that, that gets them there. So typically some stages say, we don't take applications. We decide what issues, again, for our community, and then we go find the experts on that that we're aware of. Others get recommended. And, and, and you most people know about Simon Sinek being a TEDx speaker years ago at Puget Sound. And he wasn't even the one who was asked to speak, but someone else was and said, you really need to hear from Simon. And so he was recommended instead. And then there are others. You, I mean, you can nominate someone that way too, but then you can apply as well. And it's pretty common right now with people who are, you know, coaches and so forth. Well, I just, let's just have you apply to 60 stages and everything. I, I like to have you look for ones, what's available now, what's available now um, coming up. But it's like, to me, it's like going to work for a company. Not only are they seeing if you're a fit, but you're seeing if they're a fit. Right. And so you don't want to apply if you're not a fit. I mean, you can play the numbers game, but you're going to have a bunch of a such better experience if there really is a connection there. That I kind sense. of felt that I felt that. And so that's why I'm taking my time. I've got, I've got so many irons in the fire right now <laughs> that, you know, I'm like, you know, I want to give this a hundred percent of my time. Yeah. I and do. When you say that it's, you do want to take your time because it does take about six months to put your TEDx talk together. In fact, if you were to want to, if you were looking to apply today, like St. Louis that just closed April 1st, they're going to have, they're going to let people know on the 8th. Um, so we're, we're April 5th. So in three days, people will know if they were are chosen to audition. They'll have 30 auditions. And then by the end of the month, they'll tell you whether you're going to be one of their dozen speakers. And then you'll start getting trained right away. But their event's not until the end of October. Right. And and I, I get that. And, and so I'm like, OK. But I, I it's just most people don't understand the back. Thing. Oh, I'm just going to be a TEDx speaker and just, you know, go and do this. And, and and that's why when you, I saw you were coming on my podcast, I was like, yes, not only is this topic dear to my heart because of what yeah. I'm, I'm doing, but it's also people don't understand. They don't know the backstory of it. And so that's why for those who want to become public speakers, for those who want to do different things, I'm currently the president of my Toastmasters group here awesome. locally. Yeah. So, and that helps out tremendously because all the ums and the ahs and the buts that you speak when you normally speak and, and it's, it's a distraction. It, it's kind of a, it's like a, as I say, um, it's, it's, <laughs> <laughs> it's I have said it today too, <laughs> but it, it's like that disassociation because when you say, but it disassociates the topic from what you're going to say next, but it's also an ending and you can lose people with a but. And you can lose people's attention. It's, it's like three seconds you have to keep people entertained, to keep people engaged nowadays because of, of society norms. I'm going back to my society norms. So yeah. I and, just put uh, a little chat between us. Um, something I was asked on a forum a while back, like, what are you really looking for in a TEDx speaker? Because I've seen, you know, over a thousand applications and I know why someone gets picked and why they don't get picked. And so from that, I came up with the 10 things at the top of my head, which I've kind of talked a little bit about, like you get, you have to know what they're looking for. You got to get, basically you're trying to get in the head of the organizer and you might have university students organizing an event. You might have middle-aged people. You might have older people. You might have a mixture. You might have just a couple of people organizing. You might have a dozen people help organize. It's, they're different sized stages and, and not all stages created equal, but in general, you want to get in the head of the organizer, just like you would if someone who's you might want to be employed by, like looking for a job. So anyway, if anyone's interested, they can certainly go to that link there and download the top 10 things that a TEDx speaker coach is looking for in a TEDx speaker. Mm. That's that's amazing because um, when be, people have no idea. Um, yeah. In what's fact, going on. 95 95% of applicants are rejected. Do you want to know why, Chris? Yes. Because on their application, they just treated it like a cookie cutter. They didn't answer the question that that mm -hmm. stage asked in the way that they asked it. Yes, there are common things. They all want to know these four things. What's your idea? What will people take away from you sharing that idea? Like, it's not meant to be inspirational or motivational. It can be, 
but it's an idea that can be implemented. Mm -hmm. And I'll stop there and tell you about Joe Smith, which I, I like to um, share him. He was, I think, in his 70s when he gave his talk a, a dozen years ago. And it's a short talk. I think it's four and a half minutes. It's one mm -hmm. of those under five minutes or less. He gets up there and he gives this big statistic. And then he says, um, so the way we can fix that, and it's basically about saving, saving trees or the amounts of paper, or whatever, is that when we're in a public restroom and we wash our hands, if we would shake them off 12 times, and then take one paper towel and fold it in half so that that tertiary twist helps absorb the water. We'd never need more than one paper towel, which then of course would help save all this, whatever. Mm -hmm. Now, you know, it's a sticky idea when a dozen years later, you're in a, you're talking to someone in Australia about this and they say, I was just in the, I was just in the airport and this woman was shaking her hands and folding the paper towel. And I said, Joe Smith, and she said, you got it. So that, <laughs> <laughs> and I can't go into a public restroom now without doing that. <laughs> well, I, I, one of the things that I saw, I'm a huge fan of Dyson because they're ecology and yeah. efficient. They, everything they do, they want to make sure it's good for the planet. Mm -hmm. And I'll tell you my, that story here uh, and the other, the other half of that story here in a second, but in um, Phoenix, we, I just flew to Maui. Oh, wow. they, and in Phoenix, we were there and I went to the bathroom and they have a, a faucet with two bars hanging out. And the fact is, is you put your hands under the water, you get the soap, you put your hands under the water, you wash your hands and then you turn your hands upside down and a Dyson blower. Those bars are a hand blower <laughs> to dry your hands so you don't even have to leave the sink. So the water is going back down there. So one, it's safety efficient. Uh, it's paper efficient and you're still getting the sanitation that you need. And I thought, Oh, this is amazing. This is amazing. Yeah. And see those innovations are important. In fact, I have a client right now who's has a cool invention for women's sanitary disposal, because when you have a heavy flow, it's kind of a mess and they don't want you to flush it. Right. And it's a huge problem if you do. So I'm really excited for when she gets to get on the stage and talk about that. You have to be careful about here. This, I'll go back to the things they want to know. Um, what's your idea? Why? Um, what will people take away from it? Who are you? And why should we listen to you? Mm. But the things you cannot do on a TEDx stage is sell your product, sell your religion, mm -hmm. sell your politics, or sell your world. Right. In fact, most people want to say, oh, I see people have been a TEDx speaker and there's such power in it and they get jobs and they get speeches over other people. And and in fact, there's power in a TED Talk. You're talking about a Toastmaster. I had a client who she had a, she had tried three times. And then when we worked together, she landed a TEDx talk, a TEDx stage. But she went to her Toastmaster people in addition. And they were so good to her, helping her with all those ums and the flow of it and so forth as well, that she had that, that support behind it too. And it gave her so much confidence that just in two days, now four years later, she's graduating from university already as the mom of 10 who mm. finished her education, but it gave her that confidence. You never know what power comes from a, from a TED talk, but you have to have a giving heart. You can't get up there to say, I'm going to make, you know, I'm going to have a book deal because of this or speak all over. Those things may come. You may get more clients, but it's all going to be about what do you have to give? Mm -hmm. And you are Yoda on the stage and to the Luke Skywalkers in the audience. And you're sharing that idea that can be implemented. One of the things I've always been is of service, mm. of service to humanity, to the community, to people, to injustices, because of all of those things that happened in my life. Yeah. And so the fact is, is that I went uh, when I became a shamanic <clears throat> practitioner years and years ago, I've been on a like a spiritual journey all my life. It's about helping people get beyond the soul contracts they 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 create and unknowingly do so. Mm -hmm. It's about healing and being that placebo effect as an energy healer for a person. And, and when you think about quantum physics, it's all frequencies. Mm -hmm. And it's been scientifically proven that and, and by quantum physics with the placebo effect, if I put you in a meditative state and I send you frequencies telepathically and through the vibrations on a Zoom call and you take that placebo frequency and trust it, your body can heal itself. Mm -hmm. And so the fact is, is it's 
however you want to say it, your body can, when you get beyond your mind and the critical factor of your subconscious, you can do anything. You can heal yourself. You can change your mindset. You be, can become anything. In fact, the th fact is, is I live by this. I have been healing myself all my life. And when I moved from Florida, I worked at an alternative high school. I used to work on the streets and gangs with, with in Miami Dade and Fort Lauderdale. Mm -hmm. And so the thing was, is I was bench pressing 200 pounds. I had no neck. I couldn't reach back and scratch the back of my head because my arms were like, you know, I mean, I was so masculine in my role because that's what I needed to be at the time. Mm -hmm. uh, these kids at this high school had no idea that I was working in the streets of these, these ghetto areas and, and wherever gangs went, I went and it didn't matter. And I had such amazing results. I was able to help so many kids because out of 40 years of my law enforcement career, 21 of 21 years of it was dedicated to troubled youth. Mm. And when I went to work at the high school, you when can I tell went, why because you had a special place for Kids that were I, taking I was that troubled youth as a child. Yeah. And I knew how I, the, I was fortunate. I had spirit guides that guided me. In fact, in this book, in book six of the blue talk, uh, business life in the universe, I honor one of my spirit guides that helped make me bulletproof wow. through my career. And his name was Geronimo. <laughs> wow. He was a man and yeah. he was a also a war chief and in my spiritual retreat i just went on i met a man who's friends with geronimo's great grandson who's a hundred because of your connection through your dad's line and i in september i'm going to be meeting him and honoring right. his father's spirit through me mm -hmm. to him mm -hmm. and so it is bringing that back full circle and so it's and what an opportunity. And of course, you already talked about how quantum physics has science behind it. And the mistake sometimes people make is they want to come and talk about being a shaman or having the energy and stuff like that. And most people will turn it off and Ted doesn't want it. But they but if you say it in a way with the quantum physics or the statistics and it can be heard and you really are speaking to a sixth grader. That's the level of speech. I work on a, I, I, I go from a fifth grader because working in schools, yep. being, in, being in schools, I the last place I was at was I was up here in uh, Tennessee in a school and I worked with uh, youth that um, had a hard time behaving in classes. Yeah. And I, because of my background, they had no clue, but I was a deputy. I was a reserve deputy here in Tennessee. And I wanted to get post-certified and I went to the police academy at 60. I was the oldest person there, mm -hmm. but I was out running 20 year olds, 30 year olds, 40 year olds. There was some I weren't, wasn't out running because they were amazing runners, yeah. but I wasn't the last of the pack. And that's right where I wanted to be. And I graduated and I became post, you know, certified in Tennessee. And so the thing is, is I live by the understanding you can do anything. It's all you have to do is say, wouldn't it be nice? Yeah. Oh, I love that. Wouldn't it be nice? Mm -hmm. Wouldn't it be nice? Mm -hmm. And just do it. I, I mean, I don't want to quote Nike, but it is just stepping through that threshold, stepping past your barriers, your blocks, yeah. your fears, and the uncertainty, and watching what happens once you get to the other side of that door. Wouldn't it be nice? That's a, that's a great wouldn't phrase. And, you know, I want to say that when... When someone writes a book or does a workshop, it really should revolve around one phrase, just like teaching them that thing of, you know, wouldn't it be nice and giving examples of how it works and the science behind that and so forth is so powerful. But even having something that completely out of context, you could say to someone in the grocery store or on the street that would help them. Mm -hmm. It's so powerful. And that's why you can do it in five minutes is just simply sharing that idea and giving an example of it in a wow, in a sticky way. Having a sticky moment is always impactful. And one of those ways is a story. Another is a shocking statistic. Um, but you can also have some sort of an object lesson. Bill Gates, who 
hasn't traditionally been a great speaker over the years. He has a, a brilliant <laughs> mind, but he's not a brilliant speaker. And when I was in Silicon Valley, I used to get to go to all of these um, different places and Comdex was one of them and he was often a, a speaker and I wasn't impressed with the way he spoke, but of course, you know, what he was talking about was, mm -hmm. was great. So, and he had given a TED talk before and was kind of teased about it. So he really wanted to make it stick. So when he talked about, and whether you like what he talks about nowadays or not, is not that, not, a, not what I'm hearing. I don't, about. I don't go there. I don't <laughs> even watch TV. So you're good. It doesn't matter. I'm not non-political here. Yeah. But he takes, <laughs> yeah, he takes his audience who are mainly white men that the owners of all of these huge, you know, fortune 500 companies. And he talks and he says that we spend more money on male pattern baldness than we do on malaria. Mm -hmm. And then, you know, he's got our attention that way, but then he actually has with him this little container and he talks about mosquitoes being infected and so forth. And then he opens it and says, why should they be the only ones that have to worry about it? And they're uh -huh. just, horrified <laughs> they with all their privilege are going to maybe end up with malaria and and of course he tells them later that it wasn't they weren't infected mosquitoes in fact they weren't mosquitoes at all he'd just simply taken one of those containers of a stack of cds and emptied it and taken it out there and opened it for them oh, but that, nice. it, it is a wow moment it is a something that they're never going to forget in fact mm -hmm. I, can, I wish i could remember i have to go back and find but the one the one um, president of a company, a well-known company, he's like, I am never sitting in front of home again. <laughs> it had such impact. So you you have to do it in a way where it's where it sticks with you. And, and back when we were talking about giving a gift, a lot of people, like I said, I teach public speaking. Um, that's where I got my start with all of this. And they're like, how do I get over my nerves? And I said, you give. You, you don't put the focus on, am I going to be judged? Am I going to forget? You put the focus on, I have a gift to share with this audience that can help them. And it's the same emotion, nerves and excitement. And you flip it by your focus on, I have this gift to share. And that's I, what uh, I'm on I, a stage they're looking for. Is it, is I love that because I teach my clients mm -hmm. to take a moment, just one minute, set a timer and take mm -hmm. a deep breath in, hold it, exhale, and then allow whatever fear comes up. And so why, why is this, what is this coming up? Why am I fearful? What would be the worst thing that could happen? Yeah. I stutter. What could be the worst thing happen? I burp, I fart. I, what would be the worst thing that could happen while I'm on stage? Right. But then, but what would really happen is that as you see your fear, it's no longer a fear because you identified it. Mm -hmm. And it's a, it's a, it's a psychological way of releasing mm -hmm. that fear. So that now it's like, you know, when you get laughter mixed, overcoming fear, all of a sudden it's just like, what was I thinking? I was holding myself back. I was preventing myself from becoming my best version of me. Wow. Beautiful. So when you, when, you know, I thought about, you know, getting on TEDx one time and just doing that one, you know, why yeah. are people so afraid of get public speaking? You know, are they afraid that somebody's going to, again, judge them? assume who they are, evaluate them, criticize them. Well, yeah. oh my God, what if I farted or what if I burped or what if I, I threw up on stage? What would be the worst thing that could happen? I actually had a speaker who, this was actually his second TEDx event. And he said, he said in my first one, I am just at the climax of my story and I feel the sneeze coming on and it comes and I just kind of go, <gasps> Like this, and I just keep moving, right? Because what can you do? <laughs> exactly. The thing is, is when you, I, most people do more harm to themselves by overthinking things yeah, yeah. than actually just doing it. Yeah. Instead of thinking what's wrong with me, it's like, what's right with me? Well, what not only that, but don't even think that way. It's like, why would I think negative about myself? I'm wanting to get positive. So if you're using the law of attraction, let's bring in the law of attraction. Okay. If you're using the law of attraction, it says if you see on there's like a scale of 22 with Abraham Hicks and you're down here on judgment and hate and, and everything else. And you want to be up here. You can't be thinking judgment and hate down here to get yeah. to this point. So why would you hold this baggage or these attachments to you and not allow yourself to ascend up, to get to the joy, to be able to step on stage and say, I am fulfilling 
my dream, a bucket list. I'm doing what yes. I love to do. Absolutely. I get to share this that has helped me or has helped others or it can help other people. Yes. Mm -hmm. So earlier you talked about how you had a near, near death experience. And then you also talked about how maybe you wanted to wait a little bit. Is it okay if I share a story about that? That might change your mind. <laughs> so, <laughs> I got a, the privilege of coaching a woman who had landed a stage who had had a near death experience. And again, that's going to be tricky because certain things that you can and can't say, but I was so proud of her to move forward and to do it. And she gave it the first Saturday, March, 2020. Mm. And if she had waited, that stage wouldn't have been able to do it because the neighboring stage was shut down. All the mm -hmm. stages were shut down just five, six, seven days later. And that stage, that particular stage, she had been, uh, has not even come back yet. Mm. So if she had waited, she'd never had the chance because 13 months later, she passed away. Ooh. See, and so this is, wait. oh, yeah, well, no. no, and I get that. I get that. But see, fortunately, my crown is just going crazy. My crown is just <laughs> What's I it have, doing? Well, it's just it's you know my it's just it's just tingling. It's just tingling. Yeah. I've been having this for the last week, and so it's like okay, I get the energy. I get the energy mm -hmm. the frequencies. With me, I have an intimate relationship with the Creator. We mm -hmm. talk one on one every day because I keep telling him, you know, um, why am I still here? That's the question. Yeah. Why am I still here? From four to sixteen. Yeah. Well, see, the thing was, is that the sequence is four near death, 16 near death, mm -hmm. 20, 20, my brother was killed by a drunk yeah. driver, mm -hmm. 22, I had uterine cancer. Wow. Yes. And I was a single mom. The hardest thing I had to do was call my ex-husband and say, hey, by the way, I'm having surgery. I don't know what's going to happen. This is where our child is. And, and they're going to notify you if I don't survive mm -hmm. to come get her. And that was my biggest fear and nightmare is that something bad was going to happen and being a single woman. And, and even though I had detached from the Catholic church because of all their indoctrinations and, and programming that they did, that hit me hard on the fact that all of a sudden now I'm a single woman with a child and uh, incapable of having uh, any more children. And I wanted six kids. I wanted to be that mom of six kids that could show six kids they could be loved. And all of a sudden it was no longer an option and it rocked my world. Then I had a head on car collision. And then in 2012, I had the pulmonary embolisms. I go through the police Academy. I, 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 I'm in the schools. I don't get COVID. I've got down syndrome kids pulling my mask off my face and kissing me on the face. I love you. Dress. I love you. And it was amazing. I leave, I go to a seminar, come back and I get COVID after I had retired. And I was like, oh, wow. I was sleeping 17 hours. I was sleeping 17 hours a day, you know? And it was like a spiritual thing for me. It really was an attack on my spirit. And, and as I got over it, it was like all this stuff happened. And I was just like, wow, people aren't talking about the effects of COVID. I'm not, I'm, I don't want to get political about anything, but there are a lot of effects of COVID people aren't talking about, and they should be, it could save people's lives. So again, it is a being of service. And this is just the stuff that happened to me and my husband. So it was kind of crazy, but. She had had, um, I think, oh gosh, I can't remember. It was like six or seven near-death experiences in her 30 years and knew she was here on borrowed time, but knew she needed to share that experience. You know, in, in fact, one time I asked her some questions. She said, if you've seen it in a movie, it's because someone's experienced it. And I agree with that. I, I'm actually, um, because of my journey, I went to Mount Shasta last year in uh, September and it's the root chakra of the earth. And most people don't, don't know that. And it's also the manifestation mountain. And I did a healing there. I was, I was told I couldn't take anything with me. I look like I look now going to a spiritual retreat where everybody else is all in their spiritual clothes and their, you know, adornments and their, their, talismans and all of this stuff, their drums, their rums. I was told not to take anything with me. I was supposed to go there. Like I knew nothing. Yeah. 
So he's, I was told I could take my, my crystals. I wanted to get used for mm-hmm. healing of, of Shasta. And up until that point, Shasta was closed. There was no snow on Shasta. There had been no rain. There had been no pers- uh, precipitation. Uh, there was fires in the area and had been for the last five months. And we got there Thursday. We um, And all of these spiritual healers, the drumming, the singing, the chanting, the intentions, uh, Thursday night, Friday, it started raining. It rained all day Friday. It rained all day Saturday. And Saturday afternoon, we weren't sure if we were going to be able to get up to the ski lodge at, at Mount Shasta. And four o'clock that afternoon, they were able to send all the fire trucks home because the rain had put out the fires and opened up the gate for the first time to go up to Shasta. Mm. So we go up there, I'm doing my healing. There's a lady there. And I mean, it's like 30 degrees with like a 40 mile an hour wind. And she has her glass singing bowls. Glass singing bowls don't play under 32 degrees because it's freezing and it cracks the glass. And so I'm there's a picture of me sitting there sending her energy and she's playing her singing bowls and they're sounding like angels singing mm-hmm. the whole time there. So then I did that and then we went to weed actual weed California. I don't know if you've ever heard of it. <laughs> I have heard of it. <laughs> okay. But I just for everybody has it. This is actually a town called weed and it's been weeds before all of the weed issues going down. And there's a Pluto's cave there, which is a lava tube that came off of Shasta. And in that I went in there and I didn't have a flashlight. I had my tennis shoes, a walking stick and my cell phone. That's all I had. I turned my phone on to try to use the flashlight on my phone. Wouldn't work. I try to use my phone just to see depth perception, but in the dark, it doesn't work. So I got back to cave three and all of a sudden people were breaking off doing their own thing. So I was like, you know what? I've gone far enough. So I turned around and I just started singing light language and I was just honoring my presence in the cave. And all of a sudden this woman, I didn't realize she was sitting in the dark. She says, Oh my God, I can see your tribe walking with you. I said, yes, I feel them. I actually felt their energy. I said, they healed the love in that inner child that I never had. And I feel complete. And as I continued on between cave two and three, there's a natural opening. And I felt energy coming towards me. And all of a sudden, this white out comes towards me, goes up out over the cave and over my head. And I didn't know the meaning of the owl at that point. And so I just started taking pictures in the dark. And when I got out, I had taken pictures of orbs that were all around me, but the rocks underneath me or on the side are in focus. Um, I have a vortex that's up on the upper page. I have a vortex that's on one of the pictures. It's the full side length of the page. It's a bluish color. And then there was a vortex in the center that I invert, I walked through and didn't know it. But when I came out of that cave, I was, my journey is the journey to mother Earth's chakras and vortexes. So the whole reason from Shasta to go to Maui is Maui is the vortex of Shasta. It's the energy support of the ley lines. Wow. Plus Maui's half a heartbeat of the earth. It resonates at 432 megahertz. It's a frequency. Your heart beats at 432 megahertz. The earth frequency is 432 megahertz. Amazing. So I drummed, I, I did a, um, I did drumming. I did ceremony. I did um, uh, at at the uh, several different places on Maui. I had met a uh, uh, um, a native Hawaiian. He was the manager of the Marriott there, and I saw him walking by. And I said, "Sir, can I just say I love your necklace? It's beautiful. I've never seen anything like it." And he looked down. He looked up, and then he did this, and he took it off his neck. Yeah. And he gave it to me. And this is the kukua nut. And it's traditional to Hawaii. So I was, I was in awe. I wasn't expecting that. I was, I didn't, I didn't think I was, it was totally, uh, I was like, oh my gosh. So we went to hiking into several places and drumming on the black beaches. And this fruit fell from a tree and I picked it up and I looked at it and I said, no, this is Hiram. This is medicine for Hiram. Well, it was the natural cuckoo nut in its pod before they get the nut out. Yeah. And I had gave him a chakra bracelet 
that I had gotten in Aruba. And I asked my daughter, because we left early, and I said, can you give this to Hiram? And he, she said, Mom, he started crying. He said it was the most exciting moment of his life that you gave him natural medicine and you gave him love. Mm. And I said, that's what it's all about. That's, that's what the earth is about. And when you can affect people like my corner, affecting your corner and bringing it together in light and love, I promise you, Gandhi, Martin Luther King, John F. Kennedy, Bobby Kennedy, Muhammad Ali, all of these people that spoke and stood in their power for love and light and humanity is what I'm doing now, is I'm going to all the vortexes and the chakras of the earth and doing a virtual vent from there. But I'm, I'm hoping to do a documentary for fifth graders. Nice. To understand the quantum physics of ley lines and the energy of the earth and why it spins. But these are all energy frequencies. These are all understandings. And we don't see the world from that humanitarian side. Plus, it's also harmonizing humanity, which helps harmonize the earth. That's beautiful. And so that's my journey. So again, it's 1111 here right now. So anyway, as, I, as we were speaking that, um, these are, like I said, when I said I had many irons in the fire, that's what I'm doing. And so September and December, I'm, I'm going to Sedona in September and Peru, Bolivia in December mm, to Peru. the sacral chakra. Okay. So as a TEDx speaker, you're probably, your, your mind's spinning like, holy crap, it is. what is, what, oh, oh my God, I hit the page, but it's, it is that, it is about giving back and being a service. It is, yeah. Mm -hmm. No matter what, no matter what's happened yes. to you, don't allow your past to define you mm -hmm. because that's not who you are. Those, it's what's, that's incidents that occurred either around you or to you. That isn't you. That's not your core. So, yeah. So anyway, uh, let's get back to the topic. Okay. <laughs> well, thank you. Thank three you. Tips, it. Three tips. <laughs> I could sit here and talk to you, Melissa, all day long. It's, I mean, I, it would be. But well, my, my three tips would help you with a TEDx talk. It would help you with anything in your life. And it has to do with you talking, saying that you talk, you have an intimate relationship with God. And for me, as a mother, I had to learn to ask a question and let the child, I had four kids in five years, let them know which one I was talking to because in the middle are twins. So it's kind of like, I just shout out a question and they're like, you're talking to me, you're talking to me, you know? And then I didn't stand around, stay around for the answer because they're coming home from, from um, you know, school. Like I said, I was a stay at home mom, which I love getting to do. And I, in Idaho, so I'm like scrubbing the potatoes. So I'm not really waiting for the answer. I'm just flipping the water back on and scrubbing the potatoes. And then, of course, you don't know exactly how to respond, what action to take, because you didn't pay attention, right? And I relate this to my relationship with my Father in Heaven, because when I ask, well, if I ask you a specific question, it's the same thing, but even when it's, it's to God, if I can ask a specific question, and then I stick around to hear the answer, and number three tip is then, I'm brave enough to take the inspired action, mm. even if it seems different than what society or the norm would do. Mm -hmm. My days go better. <laughs> I absolutely live by that motto too, because it is <clears throat> asking the questions. Mm -hmm. It is being clear enough and open enough yeah. with no preconceived ideas to wait to hear the answer mm -hmm. and then trust it to follow through on. And that has served me well in my life. And if I can, I'll share with you two years ago when it was some of still some of the most powerful times for me because my children and I, their father was in the hospital with COVID mm. at this time, two years ago. And you couldn't go in. Mm -hmm. you, even if you wanted, there was just no way. Mm -hmm. And so it was through my relationship of asking what I could still do outside of the hospital or what I could do for my children or what I needed to understand about my children, how I could support my children or his mother or what I needed, um, what he needed from the other side that I used it more deeply and more frequently 
than normal and had very beautiful experiences because of it. Unfortunately, it was his time and it wouldn't mm -hmm. have mattered if it was COVID or not. And of course, it's been very hard, mm -hmm. but I treasure how close I got to get to God to help me understand how I could serve and how I could love, even when I couldn't be there physically. But see, the thing is, is he knew you were there. He felt your love. And most people don't realize love is mm -hmm. more than an emotion. It's a frequency. Yeah. <clears throat> and when you're, you're putting out that energy and you're sending that love to somebody, they'll feel it. They'll know. It's just when you get that thing, like somebody's thinking about you, they're sending you love or light. Yeah. They're sending you their, their, their frequency to help motivate you, to heal you, to understand. He knew you were there. He, he, he did not die alone. No, he did not. And he's, he's very happy. He misses his, you and the kids, mm -hmm. but he, he's very yes. content to know that he's your guardian angel now and your kids. There, there was a couple of times I I'm, I'm extreme empath just so you know, because of being near death experiences. And, but there's, there's a couple of times your kids have done some stupid things that mom doesn't know about yet. Mm -hmm. And it was that they had that protection of their father that walked them through it. And so as they, as they grow, as they open up and realize it, that he's their guardian angel too. Yeah. Well, even even before January of that year, I had a, an experience where I could sense my parents and even his father um, letting me know that the support was there. And I didn't know what it was for until. Yes. Yes. Yeah. And, and most people don't realize that, you know, or when you have deja vu, deja vu is yeah. a, good, a good thing because people like, wow, what's deja vu? Well, it's because you've already experienced this moment, a past and past time dimension. And now are colliding together and it's bringing that memory back of how you responded then, but how are you going to respond now? Mm -hmm. And that's what deja vu is. And most people don't realize that. And it's not, you can call it a past life, but it is a past dimension. And in physics, I should have probably become a physicist, but anyway, in physics, <laughs> um, you can, it, it's an understanding that the frequencies collide and as they collide, it, it brings, resonates resonates with you several different things and it could be what you should have known then or how you responded then don't respond that way now it gives you those clues and if you're open enough you hear them you see them you feel them you touch them and all of a sudden you're like oh my gosh how did this happen well yeah. you know i have a one story here um we went to maui we took a well watching cruise and it was amazing. And but before we left the, the, the shore, I said to the naturalist, I said, Katie, I said, wouldn't it be nice if we saw a humpback whale swim past the boat real close to the boat? She goes, yeah, that would be great. That'd be awesome. An hour and a half into our uh, cruise. There, there's your phrase again. Wouldn't it be mm -hmm. amazing? Um, one of the other, it wasn't me, one of the other passengers on the other side of the catamaran says, what's that blue, light blue thing in the ocean? And she looked down, she goes, oh, that's a humpback well with its calf. <laughs> and all of a sudden, all she did is her head spun backwards. And she said, you manifested that. And I said, yes, I did. <laughs> that's how simple yeah. it is. People make it complicated. Yeah. So again, wouldn't it be nice? Wouldn't it be nice? Yeah, exactly. And anyway, those are my tips to I love it. I love it. I could, I could, my list, I could talk to you all day long. So. But my, what I ask of every one of my interviewees is mm -hmm. to just take a moment, take a deep breath in, close your eyes and connect to your five-year-old child. What would she say about you now mm. from where you were? Well, the first, the first thing she would say is to remember to play more been harder to play the last couple of years with grief yes um and then just you know it's to keep going and do it in a playful way to so that you really enjoy it um i'm gonna send you a link of a friend of mine mm -hmm. and she deals and it's called lean into grief mm -hmm. and it helps people understand how to be able to talk with other people who are grieving but it helps grieving people to understand why people aren't talking to them. 
And she's an amazing woman. She lives in Canada, but she's an amazing woman. And I want you, she has a Facebook page, Lean Into Grief and amazing. I went through her, her webinar just for myself. And I've recommended so many family members of my own to yeah. go through this because of the traumas and the tragedies and the deaths and, and, and unexpected. And so the fact is, is that you, if you can just share, you know, um, with other people ways of helping themselves, it empowers them. Mm -hmm. yeah. But your five-year-old child is also saying you have come further than you thought you ever would. <laughs> you found your purpose, you became a service and it has carried you further physically, mentally, emotionally, and spiritually than anything you've ever done by helping change people's lives. Mm -hmm. And that really is, thank you for sharing that. And I would say that's very true and something I don't think about, but it is very gratifying to me just to know that their life has changed even. And of course it's even more gratifying when I know that what they shared on the TEDx stage is changing other people's lives. Mm -hmm. But I just had one call me last night and he was just said, he just said, yeah, I was talking to someone. And I said, yeah, I did a TED talk. And they're like, you did what? You know, <laughs> that's so incredible. And he said, I get that all the time. And if it's between me and another speaker, I'm the one chosen and I've gotten a different job because of it. And there's just so much power. And it's because he's just so giving. And, and those who are coachable, those who want to give, those who want to share, um, and those who will go deep like this gentleman in his 30s who shared his story that you won't know but i got the privilege of hearing mm -hmm. i know that it helped him and it helped me as well i see it as very symbiotic and then what goes on the stage will help other people too well most people think vulnerability is a weakness and it is one of the most powerful strengths you can allow yourself to have yeah, I just asked 60 million people who've watched Brene Brown's talk on vulnerability, right? Well, I, I did. I, I like Brene Brown, but I didn't know she did it. But it is one of the most powerful things in you yeah. because you're stepping past yourself. You're stepping past the fears and you're allowing to speak on a cellular level with humanity and with other people. Yeah. So hang on one second. I love I love my Alyssa. I love I love you're here today. I love our talk. Hang on one second. No problem. It takes a special kind of individual to dream their dreams, their thoughts and their ideas and turning them into a reality. My Alyssa Adams, you've stepped past your fears. You stepped past the obstacles. You stayed the course. You had the courage to do the follow through to the end. My Alyssa Adams, you've championed yourself. Now we know who you've become. Thank you for sharing your ideas and your thoughts and your dreams with us here today.